since serotonin modulates the immune system, we know it partially functions as a chemoattractant. It'll, it'll pull immune cells to sites of inflammation. It can modulate macrophages and monocytes. How do you, or how much do you think that the amitriptyline is, in part of its mechanism of actions, influencing the immune system? And this kind of ties back to your, your comment on oral tolerance. So if there's this whole, you know, inter connected web of causality and loss of oral tolerance to food, which is mediated by the immune system as part of this, do you think part of what these previously called antidepressants now called sort of gut brain modulators are doing is affecting the immune system in a favorable way? Really, really insightful comment and question. I think firstly, I'd just point out that it's Doug Drossman, who is uh, the sort of godfather of, um, disorders of gut brain interaction he first was one of the first people to introduce this concept of of low dose antidepressants being gut brain neuromodulators so that's that's not something that I, a term that i've come up with although i've been involved in work with him to summarize um you know the evidence for the efficacy of these drugs across all disorders of gut brain interaction um but yes because tricyclic antidepressants are you know 60 or 70 years old they're a drug that you know i guess in inverted commas is quite dirty because they have multiple effects on different receptors so they have serotonergic re effects they have uh, effects on norepinephrine they have anti anti, uh, anti muscarinic effects which often lead to the side effects that patients experience like the dry mouth and the drowsiness but they also act on histamine so they have antihistamine effects and interestingly going back to the break in oral tolerance um, in the mouse model but also this has been observed in humans in in people with ibs you do see um in studies report that people with ibs have mast cell activation not mast cell activation syndrome because that's a completely different thing but that there is evidence of immune activation in the mucosa of people with ibs where you see mast cell degranulation perhaps in response to a dietary antigen uh, with release of histamine and these mast cells are quite close to peripheral nerve fibers in the gut wall and are probably triggering uh, sensation causing nociceptive noc effects so actually the tricyclic it may be improving pain signaling through norepinephrine but equally because of these histaminergic effects it might be that it's um, acting on mast cells and stabilizing them or preventing the release of histamine um and so you know we don't know because we haven't studied the mechanism in certainly we didn't study mechanisms in my in my trial of the drug at the atlantis trial man that's fascinating because um we've had mass cell activation researchers on the podcast um and at least i think we can speculate that in ibs there might be increased mast cell sensitivity and or a higher density of mast cells i know some people have you know made those posits um, and some people derive benefit from low histamine diets or other agents that lower histamine. So this all makes complete sense. I, I love the connection. It also has me wondering, and this, this might be a big ask of the research um, body, but do you have any sense, is there anything published showing that people will improve oral tolerance over time, or at least seemingly so, meaning that they might be able to use amitriptyline for six months, a year, what have you, and then come off the drug and maintain improved food tolerance or at least reduced symptoms? Yeah, I'm not aware of any studies like that. I mean, in, in Atlantis, uh, our, our trial of amitriptyline, we used the drug for six months <clears throat> and we offered, offered participants an extra six months at the end if they wish to continue it. Um, Dr. Drossman's theory on the length of time that you would use those sorts of drugs for is that it's a bit like the literature uh, for depression that the, the the shorter the period of time before you discontinue it the more likely your symptoms are to to relapse quite badly so i think he feels that um at least six to twelve months is reasonable and that's what i would tell my patients just going back to the histamine issue you may have seen recently that there was a, tr a belgian trial um, from Guy Boxdan's group which used um, a histamine one receptor antagonist called ibastine in IBS. Now that's a drug that's licensed for the for use for I think chronic urticaria and allergic rhinitis. Um, and that again was was beneficial, um, superior to placebo in that trial. Yeah. 
Yep, that make no, that makes complete sense. Uh, and I know a lot of our audience is interested in histamine, and the the six to twelve months makes sense. And I'll say this in terms of knowing that so many of our patients or people in our audience, they might be open to drug therapeutics, but I think they're they're all trying to be minimalistic with the amount of dietary restrictions, with the amount of supplements they take, with the amount of drugs they use. So knowing that this wouldn't be a, you're on this for the rest of your life to quell your symptoms, but rather there might be the likelihood or the potential to regain food tolerance after that six to 12 month period, and then discontinuing the drug with maintained benefit, speculatively, right? It hasn't been demonstrated, yeah. but I think it makes sense like you're saying, borrowing from the, the arc of depression literature, then that's more of a corrective than a palliative measure. And I think people will be more excited about that trial, you know, doing that trial on themselves, I mean. Sure, exactly. And because obviously, uh, certainly for the, the doses that we're using of tricyclic antidepressant type drugs, these are low dose. So, you know, it's not, they're not, you're not, you're not going to have to wean them off over months. Um, if you're taking 10 milligrams of amitriptyline for six months and you want to stop it, you can just stop it. Yep, that's a that's a really great point also. Hey everyone, okay, so we took a moment to look into a few of these interesting mechanisms regarding amitriptyline. Starting with animal and in vitro data, there was one interesting study finding a reduction in gastrointestinal inflammation in a mouse model of inflammatory bowel disease. The dosages used of amitriptyline were pretty high in the study. A different study found antimicrobial activity against pathogenic bacteria. No studies in animal or in vitro looking at leaky gut. And there weren't any studies that have checked for these effects in humans. The leaky gut antimicrobial activity at a lower dose like is used in IBS. There are human data showing modulation of gut pain and sensitivity and motility, as I think uh, Dr. Ford's doing a great job of pointing out. But in any of these human trials, we were looking to see how maybe there's a mention of a reduction in cytokines and inflammation, and we weren't really able to find anything that has looked into this in the research, at least yet. And then also looking at this potential for corrective effects. Let me first say, I don't think there's enough research to really adequately answer this question, but from the minimal amount of research that is present, there are not any studies looking at what happens after discontinuation of amitriptyline for the treatment of IBS. We did look into depression with the thinking, maybe if people are on amitriptyline for depression six to 12 months, and then they can discontinue and maintain mood improvements that would sort of reinforce there could be this corrective effect in the gut brain access, if you will. We weren't able to locate any studies that support this. The trend was more so that there was regressions of depression after discontinuation. However, these trials did use much higher dosages than recommended for IBS. So again, I think it's really too early to say. Just wanted to add what myself and the research team was able to dig up.